In 1775, Thomas Paine wrote a pamphlet stating that the freedoms of men can only be maintained by limiting the power of government. The pamphlet was called Common Sense, and today it still is Common Sense. I'm Mark Zakaria. And I'm Ruth Zakaria. This is Common Sense. Welcome back. Viewers of this program tune in for a variety of reasons. If you came today to today's broadcast looking for confirmation of our state administration's virtual lack of any ability at the fine art of public relations, you're in luck. Or if you wanted to hear a similar story about the elected members of our esteemed General Assembly, hey, we've got that too. If instead you're interested in our more philosophical take on what may lie ahead for the new House of Representatives we'll get next month, well, jackpot. We'll have that for you with almost as much accuracy as the average weather forecast. So sit back, because all that's coming right up. On today's show, you'll also see an in-depth interview conducted by State Representative Patricia Morgan, who'll talk with her colleague Mike Chippendale, to dissect the performance of the last session of the Rhode Island House. During the breaks in that four-part briefing, look for Mark and me to pop back in for a moment of satire as we ask our favorite trick, trick question, are you kidding me? As always, Je Portsmouth's Jeff Richard will bring us home with his wit and wisdom. This week, Jeff's commentary looks at life expectancy. So let's get this show on the road with some analysis of several of the news stories that most impact Rhode Islanders this week. Mark? Thanks, Ruth. Last week, Governor Gina Raimondo, sitting at the head of the Commerce Corporation's board, voted with the majority to authorize nearly 3.6 million dollars in rebuild Rhode Island tax credits to West Coast developer Lance Robbins. The move was in support of a proposed 38 million dollar redevelopment project at the abandoned Hope Webbing Company mill on Main Street in Pawtucket. The plan is to create 150 loft type apartments with associated facilities. For a few minutes it all sounded like a good plan. Then, Kate Nagel of Go Local Prov got on the phone to Washington for a chat with Lauren Saunders, Associate Director of the National Consumer Law Center. Saunders explained that Mr. Robbins was working on the East Coast these days after having been run out of Los Angeles by that city's slum housing task force. This Angelino advocacy group refers to Lance Robbins as, quote, the worst slumlord in L.A.'s history, unquote. Whoa, no wiggle room there. Saunders, herself an attorney, backed up the West Coast claim by citing Robbins' 105 building and health code violations, which resulted in 32 convictions and more than $1 million in fines actually paid to the City of Angels. Writing in Go Local Prov, Kate Nagel explained that Mr. Robbins' modus operandi was to weave an ingenious and complex web of sham companies in order to buffer himself from direct legal liability for conditions in his properties. She reported that once fines from code violations and backwater bills started getting too large, he would begin to foreclose on himself, putting the dummy corporations for the buildings into receivership to avoid personal accountability. Okay, it soon began to sound as if we just hired a shark as lifeguard down at the beach. Kate found all this out in a few minutes of checking online and one phone call to D.C. My question is, how did Governor Raimondo's people miss all this so completely? See, once again, we have a PR nightmare developing. Was the Commerce Corporation's due diligence really diligent? The scouting book on Lance Robbins seems to have been out there. If they checked at all, they found all this out. So assuming they knew about their guy's sordid past, what did they think would happen when we gave him a $3.6 million check? If the Commerce Corporation had reason to believe that this would all end well, then they should have started the public discourse on some of Mr. Robbins' past peccadilloes in order to inoculate themselves from the fierce sarcasm, ridicule, and suspicion that is now growing around this decision. If this is a good deal despite the man's history, tell us how, Governor. If it's not a good deal, please don't open our collective wallet in the first place. Ruth? Thanks, Mark. It looks like our viewers should hold off on any house hunting on Main Street in Pawtucket for a while. Folks, here's another story about how things are done in Rhode Island that will get you to do the patented Ocean State eye roll yet again. 
Senate President Teresa Piva Weed heard from her opponent for the District 13 Senate seat this week. Saab Rebecki, the independent challenger, had the temerity to actually look through the public information on contributions that Ms. Piva Weed has dutifully reported to the Board of Elections. He noticed a big spike in contributions to her campaign fund during the 22 months prior to August of 15 from the principals and employees of the law firm Adler, Pollock, and Sheehan. The correlation Mr. Rebecki made was that this 22-month period was precisely the time during which the state of Rhode Island was suing the firm for repayment of some of the $89 million lost in the 38 Studios farce. Adler, Pollock, and Sheehan was one of the group of defendants who settled with the state in August of 2015. All in all, the challenger identified $5,550 worth of campaign income from that source. He then connected the dots, noting that the Senate president was in a real minority of elected officials that have not taken a stand on the release of state police notes and findings from their four-year investigation into the mess. House Speaker Nicholas Mattiello has called for the release of documents, as have the chairs of the Democrat, Republican, and Libertarian parties. So far, Piva Weed has remained mum on the issue. She appears to be giving Saab Rebecki the silent treatment as well. As of airtime, she's not responded to her opponent's assertions. My prediction is that unless a certain well-known lake of fire and brimstone freezes over, she will not. She's banking on the whole thing to just go away if she ignores it long enough. Sadly, she may be right on that. Do you feel the same sense of fatigue in all this that I do? It seems the story that everyone is always for sale just keeps getting reinforced by bad optics like this. We begin to feel there's nothing we can do about it and just try to tune out the pain by ignoring it. As I said, that's exactly what our Senate President is counting on. If there's no quid pro quo, then say so. If you're not talking, you're looking guilty, whether that's true or not. So here's a question. What are the voters of Senate District 13 going to do on Election Day if their incumbent is looking guilty? Mark? Thanks again, Ruth. Ladies and gentlemen, the election of 2016 will be upon us in just 30 days. Wherever you look, the political landscape is about to change. The high-stakes drama at the national level is consuming much of the attention span Rhode Islanders have for political prognostication. Still, the undercard in this bout of leadership selection deserves some attention. Big things could be about to happen here in Little Rhode. It is certain that with House Majority Leader John D. Simone out of the picture, the scramble for his leadership position is on. Warwick Rep. K. Joseph Sicarci has wasted no time taking the inside track in that race. Although a veteran of only two terms in the House, Sicarci is experienced in Rhode Island political maneuvering and ambitious. He managed Gina Raimondo's first campaign for general treasurer. Although he'd love to someday be speaker, he's not foolhardy enough to count Nick Mattiello out just yet. The current speaker faces tough opposition in his re-election bid. Attorney Steve Frias is disciplined, determined, and he has the unqualified backing of members of his party from all over the state. Mr. Mattiello, on the other hand, is being damned by faint praise from his traditional power base, which is not committing the amount of shoe leather and elbow grease to his support that Frias enjoys among Republicans. All of which brings us to Providence Representative John Lombardi. In many ways, Rep. Lombardi is the dean of the Democratic Caucus. He's been a city councilor, an acting mayor of his hometown. He currently serves as its municipal court judge. He's measured and adult in all his actions, never a screamer. Smart Money says he is quietly preparing to whip the votes he'll need to be the new speaker if Steve Frias gets through to the voters of Cranston with his aggressive door-to-door -door and get-out-the-vote campaign. What are the chances of real Republican gains in the House this November? Well, this cycle, for the first time in many an election, that's at least a question worth asking. High presidential year turnout and the absence of the master lever may severely try the ability of the Democrat machine to discipline and control its voters. Earlier this year, the presidential preference primary went solidly against Mrs. Clinton. Do you think she's generating passionate support now for the general election? Six Democrat incumbents have been ousted in the primary by progressives between the two chambers. Will rank-and-file D's vote for candidates that far to the left? 
If they don't, that's an opening for the R's. Has the cumulative effect of 38 Studios, Ray Gallison, Truck Tolls, the 610 Connector, and the like fatigued the Democrats, as Ruth indicated it has in the case of Teresa Piva Weed? I don't have all those answers, but if half of them go against the majority party in only 10 or 11 of the contested races, things could really change on the floor of the House. If a coalition of just 26 votes can be cobbled together, the members can force deliberations on that floor rather than in the Speaker's chambers. Add to that the potentially more statesmanlike approach of a Speaker Lombardi, and we could actually see some real progress in the new session next year. Ruth? Last week, Rhode Island's AFL-CIO Executive Board met to consider the seven referenda questions which we will see on November's ballot. The purpose of this consideration was to determine whether the union would endorse any or all of these ballot questions to its rank and file. To no one's surprise, the results were ringing endorsements for the six of these measures which will fund continued opportunity for union members and deafening silence on the one which might jeopardize their position within the Ocean State hierarchy. Are you kidding me? Of course that's what they did. What would you expect? In fact, that's what you should do too. Vote for or against these measures based on what best serves you. Sure, the AFL-CIO is in favor of casino gambling in Tiverton. Who do you think is going to construct the facility and then staff it? That's question one. If you think gambling is unhealthy or that this casino will slice a fixed pie one more time, making each piece too small to support the projected tax revenue, then vote no. Question three through seven are a variety of bond issues to build things. Naturally, AFL-CIO is in favor. If you don't think it's good to borrow from the future to build marginally valuable infrastructure today, vote no. I think the Provport question, number five, is another 38 Studios fiasco just begging to happen. So I'm definitely voting no on that one, and probably on all of them. Question two is the one our AFL-CIO executive board did not touch. That proposes a constitutional amendment to reassert the authority of the Ethics Commission over sitting state legislators. Without asking why they think that's bad, let's look at why many others think it's very, very good. What's not to like about legislators being ethical? Sure, it closes off some options for them, and that's a good thing when you consider the slimy options it blocks. From the founding of the Ethics Commission, it had oversight of all elected officials. That only changed when Bill Irons used tortured legal thinking to dodge a bullet by arguing that the law didn't apply the same way to those in the House and the Senate. Huh? Now we have a chance to fix that travesty, so let's do it. Don't you get it? When you go to the polls on Election Day, you have to vote for yourself. Are you kidding me? Welcome to Common Sense Rhode Island. This is a program where we try to make sense out of the policies that affect your life and come up with common sense solutions. I'm Representative Patricia Morgan and we have with us as our guest today Representative Mike Chippendale who represents Foster, Gloucester and part of Coventry. Yes I do, thank you very much. Yep, and he's been, he's been in the house with me for the... Three terms. Three terms. Yeah. So he knows what's going on. And one of the things that you have also done is you've been on two oversight committees. Yes, I have. And the purpose of both of those was to study 38 studios. It, it, that's how it was uh, given to us, yes, <laughs> That's absolutely. how it was given to you, that's right. So the first one was when um, uh, Speaker Fox was there, Gordon yes. Fox. He um, made Mike Marcello the chairman of the oversight committee and you were a member. I was. Tell us how that went. Yeah, it, from the beginning it was very clear that it was extremely choreographed and orchestrated. Um, I don't fault how Representative do Marcello for that, but he, he, his leash was really short. Uh, the, the, the speaker at that time would not let him get documents that we needed or that we felt we needed. And, and the process was, felt like a dog and pony show from the beginning. 
And so you mean you wanted to ask for documents, but the speaker wouldn't allow you there to, was, to get them? Right. There was or a you document. Mean to ask for them? Well, there, I can't tell you exactly what happened, but I can tell you that there was a document request made to EDC, and we got certain emails and, and documents from them. But later, when the court documents were revealed and we saw all this stuff from EDC, we realized they hadn't given us everything. Now, whether or not. It went through the speaker's office and he filtered out the things that he thought were not ready for consumption. I can't say. Or whether or not EDC just didn't provide them. That I don't know. Either way, uh, it, it, again, it, we weren't working with all the information. It was... I'm sorry. I'm that's sorry. okay. Go ahead. Uh, it was just, uh, it, it was a swim upstream the entire time. And thankfully that was only a short amount of time that we had that set up in, in oversight. All right, so you requested documents. You, you only got partial documents. They could have been, EDC it, might not have provided them or the speaker's office could may have, have filtered them, out. Filtered them yeah. out. And I can tell you, if we, had, if we had everything then that we have now, we certainly could have made more of, a, of an impact, I think, on the overall process, but we, there was a lot of absent information that, that didn't allow us to put the whole thing together. But I think you just brought up one of the real problems um, in the House is that even when you have a committee, it really is tightly controlled yes. by the Speaker, uh, yes. by leadership. So you're, you're only allowed to go as far as the Speaker wants you to go. I would agree with that. Yeah, yeah, so that's a that's a real issue because I know you were really trying to dig and we, we other people yeah. outside of outside were trying to give you information. You tried to yes. follow up on it, but you weren't allowed even to introduce it then to the committee. Right when when uh, when Nick Mattiello took over as speaker and he appointed uh, Karen McBeth to be the chairman, uh, I was the vice chair. Um, we got a lot of people reaching out to us yeah. just out of the blue saying, hey, finally they put some people we can trust in charge, so here's stuff. And when I say stuff, I mean... They, they gave you real documentation. Someone who worked at 38 Studios from the very beginning of that company and is still very close with Schilling handed us a disc with so much, every invoice, every work order, every job order that 38 Studios ever had and proof of all of, all of the stuff that happened. Uh, we got contractors and subcontractors coming to us telling us how this is how it was operated in the background. So yeah, a lot of people came out of the woodwork because they felt that they could trust the new uh, makeup of, of the Oversight Committee. So we did get a lot of good information, which of course we immediately offered up to the Rhode Island State Police and the FBI. And everything we ever got immediately went, went to, them. to them. Yes, and, and as Chairman Rep. McBeth at the time, to avoid having anybody filter out emails or documents from requests, she submitted those requests through the speaker's office, which she had to do, but she also sent the APRA request directly to the entity asking for them to send it via registered mail to her directly so that we would know if anything was skimmed out. Oh, okay. And so that way, it, 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 we did get a lot more information, a lot more documentation through that Good. methodology. I think I recall that it was from your committee that we found out about um, the sound stair, the yes. sound system. Yeah. It was actually your committee that kicked that up into the public. That home. was one of the the subcontractors that came out, reached out out of the blue, didn't know us, uh, took a real leap of, of, of faith that we wouldn't, uh, you know, uh, do anything crazy with the information he gave us. But he he came on Buddy CNC show with me and everything, provided documentation that indeed they did install a twenty five thousand dollar sound system in Taza. Cafe, which was owned by Michael Corso, a close confidant of Gordon Fox, who is the, the kingpin of the entire 38 Studios debacle, Michael Corso. Um, and so we, we did uncover, and we did have a witness, a person who was perfectly willing to, to, to provide all the documentation, which the state police did validate, by the way, the documents he provided as being legitimate. And, and this real. was a guy who was just personally offended Absolutely. that taxpayers were made to pay for a private company's yes. sound system, and, he, he just and a felt, pretty nice sound system. Uh, yeah, for twenty-five thousand dollars, I hope it sounded what, uh, really nice. But <laughs> um, he he was uncomfortable with what his company was making him do. Yeah. And when he voiced that, he got sh sh sort of edged out of that company by the owners who were working as subcontractors to Napa, um, and uh, he just got Na out of the out of the business. So Napa is the company that. Corso owned. No, uh, Michael Corso. No, he owned, owned the Taza Cafe, which is where they put the twenty-five thousand dollars sound system in. Napa Construction 
uh, Steve Napa, I believe his first name is Steve, uh, owned that, and he was a close friend of Michael Corso's. Oh, okay. So he got the so general So he just added that as a nice gift for his buddy? Yes. It appears from everything that we received that n when a job was given to a contractor or a subcontractor, they were never asked to bid it. They would just say, okay, you're going to do all the, the tile work. Um, Michael Corso, through contract, which we have a copy of, got paid 9.5% of every dollar that went out of 38 Studios to pay for nine that. And half nine and a half percent of every dollar that he was got one of the four contracts for he had being a middleman. Um, we actually have an EDC email from a very uh, high And he just gave it out to his friends. He did. And he didn't ask them to, to bid. Uh, they Make could sure come that in it with was the best price. bid. Yeah. Um, while we were never able to prove it, uh, the independent contractor who did give us that documentation stated that the contractors were also kicking up. So in addition to 38 Studios giving him 9.5% for every dollar spent, the contractors who got the bids were kicking him 10% for every dollar they got in work. Um, that's unsubstantiated by documentation. If I were so that an attorney general or a, or a police, a state you, policeman, you I may have been able to that. Uncover, uh, oh. uncover that, but um, I wasn't able to as a legislator on the oversight committee. And we don't know that if the state police don't validated well, it or I, not because we haven't, they correct. haven't, they yeah. haven't revealed correct. their... I know that they were given all the information. We were relative to that whole scheme, if you will, of, of the contract and the 9.5% 9, 9 going both ways. Um, whether or not they investigated it thoroughly, I don't know. I can't say because none of it's been released. None of it has been revealed no. to, to folks. Regret Regret regrettably, yeah. I think we deserve to know. Well, it's I mean, our money that was used. Absolutely. If you look at, if you look at just recent events, uh, the, the town or the city of Cranston had a, an issue where the state police performed an investigation. And as soon as they were done, they released a full document, on a full report on their investigation into the police department in Cranston. So why can't the state police sure. release their information on this investigation to us? Uh, the oversight committee at a minimum if not to the public so that's a, a, a question that i will continue to ask because it doesn't uh there there's, there is precedent for them releasing information like this they're just choosing not to i think that's a very good question to ask and i imagine our viewers do too so we're going to take a break right now and let them ponder that and we'll be right back now that we don't have disgraced rhode island board of elections boss robert kando to kick around anymore What's going on down at the BOE? Well, at their last meeting, the board, temporarily headed by Robert Raposa, unanimously voted to refer campaign finance violations to the Attorney General for criminal action. Does that mean we're out of the woods with our formerly dysfunctional Board of Elections? Are you kidding me? In this case, Mr. Raposa emerged from the executive session where the vote was taken to say that the subject of the referral was Providence City Council President Luis Aponte. He would not go on record, however, as to the actual nature of the violation in question. He left that to the discretion of the Attorney General Peter Kilmartin. So the unspecified charge is being cast into the bottomless pit of the stealth Attorney General's in-basket. Oh yeah, that'll turn out well. Still, the newly reinvigorated Board of Election also cited two other Ocean State Pauls as facing similar action for campaign finance violations. They were Peter Palumbo and Gwendolyn Buckley Andre, both of Cranston. Neither will be on the ballot this November, and Palumbo has not even declared for office this time around. Okay, okay. Well, walk first, run second. The Board of Elections took a unanimous action on behalf of its mandate to enforce the campaign finance laws of our state. Bravo! That nothing will ever come of it since it was sucked up by the black hole of the AG's office has nothing to do with the BOE. The Board of Elections does offer us one other example for the rest of state government though. The way to fix the yawning void of the AG's office is by exactly the same process used to fix the board. Find it a new boss. Are you kidding me? Welcome back. I'm Representative Patricia Morgan, and we have as our guest today uh, Representative Mike Chippendale. And Mike served uh, twice on the oversight committee that was studying 38 studios, or at least attempting to investigate yes. it. Um, and found it really difficult. You were really kind of cut off at all. Absolutely. Every time you, you tried. But in our last segment, you said you were, you were talking about some of the abuses. And I know, 
when I go door to door, people are asking me, where did all the money go? Right, sure. where did it go? Because Kurt Schilling didn't get all of it. No. Um, where did it go? Um, initially, Schilling was, was told through Corso and Tom Zaccanino, who was his confidant, and Corso was uh, Fox's confidant, and the two of them kind of orchestrated this, told that they would, he, they would be able to secure $125 million for him, which is what their company estimated they would need to launch the two games successfully. So even their own company said we need $125 yes. million. Um, so from what we could tell from the emails, uh, they got the $75 million loan program. Uh, but they didn't added. get $75 million. No, they didn't. That was added to the bill that was passed by the General Assembly, okay. totaling $125 million. Now, whether or not that was coincidental and, and used to, to try to lure Schilling into Rhode Island, I have no idea. We found nothing to support that, but it, it's just odd that it's the same exact number. When they got down to brass tacks of, of getting the bonds put together, they tried private placement bonds that didn't work. Uh, the the uh, financials of 38 Studios were just too raw. They were too young. They had no product, no assets. Um, and video games are notoriously bad absolutely. investments. Absolutely. Uh, even with 38 Studios projections on uh, on how well they would do, they were estimating they would perform 200% better than the best performing video game uh, of its kind at the time, and which still to this day is, which I, I don't remember the name of. Yeah, um, but they couldn't validate even what no, their projections were no. going to be. So at the end of all of the, between Bond Council, the investigation of, of the, the, the ratings, the, uh, uh, the agencies they dealt with, um, all of the interest and everything else, Schilling was given $49 million, which when that was learned uh, by 38 Studios, this was before the, the, the bonds were underwritten and, and the money dispersed, they had serious concerns, and, and the EDC emails that go back and forth absolutely demonstrate that there was a, co a concerted effort among government officials and those at EDC to, to sort of paint a rosier picture to Schilling and to kind of string them along a little bit on it's going to be fine, we'll get you the $125 million with film tax credits and this and that and the other thing, all sorts of promises that, as we know now, um, Corso and Fox did try to, to, to um. uh, execute. Um, but Governor Chafee stopped it at the last moment, either uh, just because he felt like stopping it or he was on top of things because it was a little known fact at the time that a non-Rhode Island company cannot receive film tax credits in Rhode Island and, and 30 Studios was a Delaware LLC. And so they were, not, they were not eligible to receive film tax credits from the state of Rhode Island. And on those grounds, I think, uh, the Chafee administration decided not to to even let them explore that option. That's when things really got ugly, and for the company, when it fell apart in 2012. Well, that's um, when it got ugly for taxpayers. Well, it was ugly for taxpayers learned, yeah. the whole time. It I was. Think. We just didn't know about it. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, you know, still. Hey, this this baseball star is bringing this really cool high tech company into our state, and he's going to create a bajillion jobs, and, and the world's going to be focused sure. on this knowledge district, and that's going to be the anchor. But and then next thing we know, two years later. Uh, they're out of business. Yeah, and we're left holding holding the bill. A hundred million dollar bag. But um, so with the twenty five million dollars, some of it was to pay off the bonds, and then there was this other pot of money that just went into the building infrastructures. That no, did? that came out. The infrastructure came out of the forty nine million. So there was. Uh, oh, so he really didn't get forty nine oh, million for oh, no, his not company. At all. He not actually had close. to spend twelve Absolutely. million of the forty nine. Yes. Just to rebuild yep. a building that was perfectly fine. Right, and part of the underwriting uh, stipulated that there had to be reserve funds and in, in, in uh, uh, able to pay a certain number of payments for a couple of years pre revenue sure. payments. So there was this pot of money that he couldn't touch. That was part of that twenty five million. But when when they moved in, um, and and he was really looking at a couple of other locations. One of them, I think was the GTech location, uh, the old GTech location. Sure. Um, however, it, it appears that uh, Michael Corso really forced their hand on, on a Providence property and gave them three to choose from, which they were really weren't happy with. And this is, again, coming from someone who worked at, at 38 Studios. Uh, but they were really forced into picking one of the three. They did pick Empire Plaza, one Empire Plaza. Um, but they didn't really want it. It wasn't the They didn't really the want it. Uh, it, it, did, it did require a lot of work. They didn't know how much at the time. At the time, uh, when they were complete with all of the build-out, they called it, of the building, it, it, they were invoiced $12.5 million by the general contractor. Well, and I understand they replaced a stairwell. 
Oh, they replaced a lot for, of things. I oh, mean, sure. like a million bucks, a uh, stairwell. Yeah, a was, stairwell is a stairwell. You, absolutely. Right? It's not a, it's no. not, a, it, it's utilitarian. It's absolutely. not supposed to be a grand staircase no. that people go up and down. No, and, and you know. I, I've never heard of replacing one. No, it was, there was a lot of overspending on that job. And you can tell just by looking well, at the invoices. Well, when you're making 20% on every dollar, you'll, sure. You have an incentive to, to, to sell it up, I would agree. And that, that's really, I think, the biggest driver in why this whole thing fell apart was just they were too many hands in the pot. Too many hands in the pot. Too early. They they thought this was going to be a great, successful company that they'd be able to milk forever. Um, it didn't work out that way because one individual was milking faster than make, anyone else. Because you got to make you got to make sure that the company is successful. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. you got to feed the cow before you can get any milk out of it. You, you absolutely do. Right. Um, so, in addition to the build out of the building, there were a lot of lawyer fees. Absolutely, yeah, and and underwriting the bond fees. council fees, which is uh, legal fees, um, and insurance uh, fees. underwriting fees. Yeah, oh, insurance fees. They they paid five hundred and sixty thousand dollars for an insurance policy on the bond itself. Uh, there was a lot of money that went towards, I guess, what we do, you would call administrative fees, if if you were. So in that a came out of his forty nine million. Came out, uh, well, no, those came out of the total. All the stuff we just spoke about, but. but the, the out of the 49 million came the build out of the building the hiring of the people all that so by the time they got done with all of that they had very little capital to work with and were scrambling that's when michael corso really started to kick into high gear that's when he inked his fourth contract i believe it was with them to secure um tax credits of which i believe i'm going from memory right now because i have read a lot of documents i believe of those tax credits corso personally received 37 cents of every dollar that per the per the contract, that contract was never realized because the tax credits never happened. However, he stood to make a good chunk of money off of simply being there. And, and who is who is Michael Corso? Michael Corso how did he, is a good How friend. did he get insinuated into this process? Sure, he's, because there should never have been a middleman. We don't no, need a middleman. We did not need a middleman at all. Uh, he facilitated all the meetings with with uh, Schilling's people and Schilling and Fox and everyone else. He he held everyone's hand through the process, the builders, uh, every contractor, who got used, who didn't get used. At one point, uh, someone in He EDC, controlled the contractors, he everything, controlled everything. He controlled everything. At one point, uh, there was an email that, that, we were, uh, that we received in the Apple request that uh, an, a member of EDC, a higher ranking member of EDC, demanded to everyone in a very large email chain that went in and out of state government that, please remember to CC Michael Corso on all correspondence regarding 38 Studios. Why is a quasi-government agency dictating to Rosemary Booth Gologli and all of these other people in government that they have to CC a private lawyer who happens to be really good friends with, with this, the then Speaker of the House? Doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, and it doesn't make sense that he was never subpoenaed either. It doesn't. We subpoenaed him in oversight, and he never responded, Untouch of course. Untouchable. Untouchable. No one even knows where he is that I'm aware of. Oh, they know where he is. Well, certain just, people may. Yeah. Yes, one of them's in federal prison. Tend not to be too cynical, but it's hard in this case. It is. At any rate, we're going to stop right there. We'll be right back. Newsflash! Stop the presses! Rhode Island General Treasurer Seth Magaziner has taken a position on the future of the state pension funds he oversees. Are you kidding me? I'm not. Last week, Magaziner's office actually issued a press release, and this one contained a policy position that represented new news. <laughs> the Ocean State will begin to step back from its investment positions in hedge funds. Senate President Teresa Piva Weed responded by saying, and I quote, huh? House Speaker Nicholas Mattiello was reported to have replied, oh, I told him to do that. Meanwhile, noted financial guru Mike Riley was widely quoted as having said, it's about damn time. It seems that right after eight straight quarters of losses in fund principal under his management, General Treasurer Magaziner became dully aware that shrinking the fund was a bad thing. The problem with hedge funds is they usually carry far more sizable management fees than equity funds or treasuries. That higher number skimmed off the top means the hedge fund has to far outperform the average market levels in order to justify that bigger overhead. You just got that in two sentences. It's taken Mr. Magaziner a bit longer. So it seems that the political pain and suffering of losing state workers' money has finally become more acute than the pain and suffering of breaking with his predecessor, now Governor Gina Raimondo, who set up the hedge fund strategy in the first place. 
Well, what about the pain and suffering of the state workers and present pensioners who look at the dwindling assets and wonder how they are going to pay their bills when that cash runs out? Are you kidding me? Welcome back. I'm Representative Patricia Morgan, and we have with us today um, Representative Mike Chippendale. And he has an awful lot of history with 38 Studios and just how difficult it was. Um, Mike, you were on two oversight committees, yes. and yet you've just talked about this Michael Corso mm -hmm. and how integral he was to the whole implosion Absolutely. of this deal. Yes. Why wasn't he ever subpoenaed? Well, he was, he, he was subpoenaed at one point by the oversight committee, the second oversight committee, but uh, failed to appear uh, and rejected it summarily. Um, he lives I, in Massachusetts or somewhere. He had a Cranston address, but yeah, I think uh, service was made at a Massachusetts address as well as a Cranston address, and they were never able to locate him. Um, whether or not anybody really knows where he is, I, I don't know. But, but So he slept in his car for a while? He, he may have. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm sure he has uh, friends all over, <clears throat> all over the place that he can uh, hang out with. Um, but, you know, he was, again, Corso was Fox's right-hand guy. He did a lot of the background stuff, uh, fundraising and, and, and generating uh, money for Fox and helping him with these deals. In fact, if you think about this, and, and, and it makes perfect sense to me, we know Fox is sitting in jail for certain things right now, one of them being taking a $52,000 <coughs> bribe yeah. when he was the vice chair of the licensing board of Providence. Are we to expect that once he becomes the most powerful politician in the state of Rhode Island, he's not going to bring that sort of lack of ethics with him and only amplify it as his powers amplified? You know, I keep mentioning I that. that we, 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 we pointed out, the Republicans pointed out, because we took him to the Ethics Commission and he was fined $10,000 right. for having a special deal with GTEC. We pointed out that he had unethical tendencies yes. and behavior. And they still made him speaker. Absolutely, and and you you reap what you sow, and and certainly in this case. Or um, maybe maybe they like it that way. Perhaps but they let's do. Let's not go down that road. Perhaps, yeah, no, and, and so we work really very hard. I mean, there had to be fifteen thousand emails, that you some read of multi page, all of them. yeah, the bond to offerings, phone calls absolutely, and and. and you, you pour so much of yourself over this to create a timeline and to, to map it all out and try to figure out exactly what went on, only to sort of be stonewalled on the governmental level by the leadership, which was clearly an issue with Fox, uh, less so with Mattiello, but still we weren't able to get all the things that we needed. It took so a he allowed while. you to subpoena, but can't you Well, that only can't came after work? a lot of public outcry. Yeah, can't you work with the police of another, co another state to have them deliver the subpoena and actually have the person come in, or well, there's no way to make them. Once they were issued, yeah, that, the process servers did that. They would they would uh, interact with the local municipal police departments or whoever was the jurisdictional uh, head of that area and and try to serve process on on the individuals that we that we did subpoena. Only Stephen Costantino so came down to do so. Sure. And, um, other than that, everyone else just re you rejected on. it completely. Yeah. And so we. We waited until, not you, because I know you, you and, and Representative Macbeth were working really hard at this, but we kind of waited until Michael Corso no longer lived in Rhode Island to get the subpoena to him. It, it certainly uh, fell together that way, absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah we, we tried everything we could uh, as standalone representatives and chairs and co-chairs of the, of the committee to do as much as we possibly could. Uh, but as you pointed out, it's, it's, everything has to go through the leadership. They have to approve the agenda. They have to approve everything. And while I was never in any agenda discussions uh, with this particular committee, I, I do know directly from Rep. Macbeth that she had a tremendous time. I mean, she would spend, to her words, an hour just trying to get two words changed in the agenda. Um, so it was very challenging for her. So naturally, as all things tend to take the path, path of least resistance, uh, an opportunity with the SEC came. Yes, Ooh. and I think that that was really clever of yeah. you. Yeah, well, it was, because it was if you're, Macbeth, to right, be, to be it, honest. You know, you, you keep hitting blockades where you just 
you just keep moving on until exactly. you find a place where you can exactly. make a difference. And you went to the Securities and Exchange Commission. We did. Well, it started with conversations with uh, a gentleman named Edward Seidel, who, who is uh, financially uh, someone who's very well regarded. Uh, he's I've always seen his at odds with with the uh, the rating agencies and stuff. He, but he's in Forbes magazine, he's in Money magazine well, all the time. A lot of people had Absolutely. problems with the rating agencies. A lot of states are still Standard suing them. Uh, That's right. They are being sued. Moody's, the Standard and Poor's. Yep. Because they gave rosy um, projections, ratings yeah, absolutely. to bonds, that just which shouldn't. probably sh didn't absolutely. deserve to get those ratings. And then we had the 2008 implosion, yes, right? Absolutely. Where they were giving triple A's to, to, sub, to subprime absolutely. mortgages. Absolutely. And, and so through this person, there was a contact made at the SEC, the Security and Exchange Commission, who reached out and spoke with Rep. McBeth. Um, Everything we had as far as information was handed over to them. Okay. Uh, it was public information. There was nothing um, inappropriate about that. Uh, and then that was it. That, w that was all that happened. And, and probably four months later, I think it was probably four months later, maybe six months later, the SEC uh, announced that they were filing charges against mm -hmm. um, parties involved in the 38 Studios transaction because of inappropriate uh, activity and, and sure. behavior. Um, they found culpability. They did, they, and they found it rather quickly. Uh, yeah, I mean, we have an attorney general who for four long and exhaustive years finds nothing yeah. that anybody did that was wrong or that even the public should know about, right. right? It's not that bad, don't worry about it, trust us. And yet the SEC, after four to six months, they had found Had enough to file people. a suit, absolutely. They did, they yeah. went after some folks. Um, two of them got fines. Yep. Those were employees of the EDC. Absolutely. So uh, Keith Stokes, who and was Mike, the director. He was the director, and Michael Saul, the executive uh, deputy director. Or, um, uh, so he was the one who actually was, had was moving the process through for 38 Studios? Most, yeah, mostly it was Saul. And, and Stokes, as the director, was less involved, but he was always in, in the loop as sure. far as emails went. Uh, but Michael Saul was, was really the lead contact over at EDC as far as the high up stuff goes. And um, so both of them pay, paid fines to the SEC. Did, yeah, yeah. Both of them are also named in the Rhode Island civil lawsuit against the EDC. So, you know, obviously they, they played a hand in it. Um, and now there's still ongoing activities from the Securities yes, and Exchange is. Commission against the underwriter and the the, the um, bond council there, there bond were other, council? yeah there were other uh, there were rating agencies Moody's Barclays they were all in, involved with uh, because in the suit in, in this case they misled bondholders that's yes. all the SEC can do they can't say well you know what you did to the taxpayers was wrong but they can say what you did to bondholders right. how you how you presented this deal to people who bought your bonds right. and, and I can, was fraudulent. Yes, I can roughly uh, quote uh, an e a snippet from an email from a, a young employee at EDC whose name was Sean Aston. He was a policy analyst and he was assigned to this. Sean said in one email that, and speaking from his perspective, I have had more information on a 10K microloan than I have on a, th on a $75 million um, bond-backed loan to a company with that is pre-revenue. So, so this, this young was, man yeah. was calling out from the beginning, this goes back to the very beginning, that the stuff's not adding up. Rosemary Booth, Booth Globally, very well reputed as far as finances go in the state of Rhode Island, said the same thing. I don't have enough information to, to, to even say whether this is, is good. So Governor clearly Ramonda, this was just pushed through. Pushed through. Push it through. Absolutely. We don't care about the details. Don't worry. Don't right. worry. We don't care whether this cow has food to Absolutely. eat. Absolutely. <laughs> and there was an email also in one of the emails from one of the uh, the the agencies that was was rating this offering um, that that said we didn't put any time into downside projections. We only have upside projections. In response to someone asking where are the downside projections, so we can compare what the net you know, the net value is uh, yeah. based on that. They never did downside projections. And as I referred earlier, the upside projections were so wildly off the mark that there's no way they could have hit it. Yeah, because the idea was, don't worry, the state of Rhode Island is gonna take care of you, yes. no matter what. Yes, it was. Okay, and that means you. Um, we'll be right back. Sometimes you just have to wonder about whether or not your local newspaper editor is a sadist or not. 
That crossed my mind when I perused last week's edition of the Valley Breeze and saw a feature article on the long-range weather forecast. The short version is, we're going to get snow, snow, and then more snow this winter. Are you kidding me? Look, <laughs> I get it. The paper's mission is to inform its readers. There are some things we just don't want to hear about, though. The Valley Breeze article at the end of September predicting many small to moderate snowfalls all the way through mid-spring was more than I cared to be told as we're feeling the first chills of autumn. So I chalked it up to some kind of reader harassment program cooked up by an editorial staff that's angry over being in print journalism during its twilight days. They're mad because circulation and advertising is decreasing as more and more of us get our news from digital sources. But don't take it out on those few of us still hanging on to the old ways. Come on, guys. Everybody knows there's a notorious amount of wiggle room in every weather forecast. The farther out the range of time covered by it, the less accurate it can be. So if you need to fill a few inches, why not spin a sweet-sounding yarn of persistent high pressure over southern New England, which is expected to block Midwestern snowstorms and force them out to sea south of us? Let New York, Philadelphia, and South Jersey have the white stuff. What's so wrong about making us feel good for a change? Maybe I'll even buy a couple of extra copies of that paper just to send to folks I want to harass in the Delmarva Peninsula. You, you cover politicians, don't you? Do what they do. It's called spin. Are you kidding me? Welcome back. I'm Representative Patricia Morgan, and today we have with us Mike Chippendale, who's the representative from Foster, Gloucester, and Western Coventry. And Mike has been um, on the two oversight committees who have tried to study 38 studios. You know, we were just talking about the fact that the Securities and Exchange Commission, they were able to look at the financial aspects, the bond aspects of this, and they found culpability. Mm -hmm. And two people have been fined already, two other organizations, the banks that were involved, they are still on the hook, oh, I think. Um, we have an Attorney General, though, who just completed his investigation, and he's refusing to even give us any details. Yeah. So kind of the SEC has given us a snapshot into the financial and said, no, this stinks. Yeah. Something there is bad. Absolutely. It was wrong. We're finding, we're finding fault. I would imagine there is fault on the non-financial side. Oh, absolutely. That we're not getting, we're not getting names, dates, right. who got what, what it was spent on. We're not getting any of that. Where do we go from here? You know, I, I, I know you banged your head against sure. this for two long years. Sure. It, it, uh, you know, in all those emails that I read and, and that we received, I can state without a hesitation that Kilmartin was nowhere near this. I don't believe he knew anything about it. I believe he was just another duped member of the House who voted for what sounded like a rosy deal. But his friends are the leadership. His they helped friends. him to become Attorney General. Exactly. And so. In, in the respect that he doesn't want to release documentation, I don't believe it's because there's still an open criminal investigation. I don't buy that. I believe not it's unless you're waiting for this statute of limitations to exactly, run out. Exactly, exactly. And the statute is is six years, and we're almost there. So, I believe he's more uh, he's more inclined to be protecting his friends' reputations. Uh, I believe there are political players as well as non-political players who would be um, who would be harmed reputationally. Uh, and politically were all of his findings to come out because little old me and little old Karen Macbeth found out a lot of stuff mm -hmm. so if I had the power of the Attorney General's office behind me I think I could have found out more stuff so I have to believe that he found well, out more Well they said stuff. they interviewed 114 people I mean of that I think it was 146 146 you know and I know that we've had on our our show uh, Mike Riley who's yes. a financial uh, wizard he actually is. expert and he has said that he found that the day before um, 38 studios collapsed yeah. that somebody sold a lot of bonds one point oh, yeah, I think it was 1.25 million dollars so one and a quarter was sold the day before million. they went under right so I'd like to know who that person is and who were. told them Absolutely. To sell their bonds. And, and going through all, even the, the, the individual I know at 38 Studios who was very intimate with the whole thing doesn't know who those private investors are. So I'm not sure how you get that. That's way outside of my 
You can find work. it if you're um, an attorney general, I imagine. Yeah, I imagine if you were an attorney general or, or a state police uh, colonel, you probably Because if find there's it. any kind of culpable or fraudulent activity, you're allowed to get those names yeah, and absolutely. ascertain that. And even, let, let's just stipulate, because we're nice, that there was no criminal wrongdoing. I said if. Right, if. What about the political wrongdoing? That's what I believe the big cover-up is. What about the harm to taxpayers? What about the harm, the harm to, to our the citizens? State. Yeah. Absolutely. From the beginning, many of us, including you, have called for an immediate default on the quote-unquote moral obligation bond, which is unconstitutional in the state of Rhode Island, Article 6, uh, Section 16, the I think it is. The offering itself said... Absolutely. You, and the offering itself said you do not have to pay this back. That's right. However, they required us to buy uh, a $75 million insurance policy in, in the event that we didn't pay it back. We've been calling for that default and it's been summarily rejected by all of those people in leadership for various reasons. Oh, how it's going to hurt the state and, and there was this little show where a couple of leaders went down to New York to talk to the rating agencies. They had a nice, they had had a nice, nice dinner. Steak dinner. Um, and, and we know the rating agencies are going to do what the, what's best for the rating agencies, which is why they're being sued by states as it is. But we did have individuals testify before us that the harm to Rhode Island financially would be so uh, immaterial compared mm -hmm. to the benefit of doing it. Of right. course, the, the, the witnesses that, that the leadership lined up to come before the Oversight Committee to address that specific answer, what would a default do to the state? They all had the doom and gloom oh, projections, yo, John yeah. Simmons and oh, all of them. Always unbelievable. Um, but, but even Robert Cusack, who came up, he said, look, I can't tell you. It'll this be is, negligible this is because we actually and pay all of our other it, bonds. And he pointed out this that is it's moral not, obligation. Right. Yeah. It's not an ability to pay versus a willingness to pay. In the past, the only thing they've ever seen is where states or municipalities were, were unable, unable to pay. We're unwilling to pay on moral grounds and legal grounds, which mm -hmm. he believed and many believe we have a strong standing. So yes. if we activated that insurance policy, what's the first thing that would happen? The insurance company would get their investigators to go through this thing and they don't care who knows who. They don't care if you know a guy. They're going right. to go through everything. Because now and their money is on the line. Absolutely. They're not going to pay that unless instead they of, have to. Instead of the poor taxpayers. And whatever they uncover is coming out. Wh wh whoever's name it is, whether they're political, non-political, it doesn't matter. They would bring it all out. So I still say, let's stop paying that damn loan. Let's let well, the investigators because come in because we won't have to pay for this investigation. The insurance company's going to do it. For four years, the Republicans have asked for an independent yep. investigation, and that's been shot down by the Democrats absolutely. every single time. So it seems at this point that the only way to do it is really not to pay. And, and we were told repeatedly, as you know, every time we requested a special prosecutor that, look, the attorney general's dealing with the criminal part, let the legislators legislate, let the prosecutors prosecute, the state police are, are looking at it. So they were trying to give us hope, you know? Okay, so we don't need that investigation because there's real investigations going on. But he didn't. And then these two real investigations come out and say there was nothing wrong. Well, I, no one can swallow not, that. Listen, they're not, it might not be criminal. Right. But we have a right Absolutely. to that information. We have we need we have, we a, have right a right, to, right know. to all the witnesses' names. Absolutely. Everybody who had their fingers in that pot of money, we have a right to know. Absolutely, and and we should we should know how politics works. In it's the a background. moral obligation that to the people of Rhode obligation. Island. That is the only moral obligation that whole 38 studios mess right what you just said. So, is it possible for us? So we have tried now to get an independent investigation. Mm -hmm. We've been told, no, don't worry. The state police are doing the it. The attorney it. general, they yeah. got it. They got it under wraps. We know that they've done it. We don't know how well right. because they're not really giving us no. any of the, the backup material on it. It seems unless we get more Republicans elected, we'll not ever get an independent yeah, investigation. Uh, that, that would certainly be one way of doing it. That, uh, yeah, I absolutely. think you changed the political uh, makeup up there. Absolutely. Um, you know, we just need people to, to realize, and I, it doesn't. It could be a Republican, it could be a Democrat, Independent, it doesn't matter. They just need to realize how important this is and the gravity of the entire situation. Because most of the people in Rhode Island know what they see on the news, which is a the proverbial tip of the iceberg. I'm talking just a little pointy part at the top. The rest of it is on the water, and that's kind of what you and I have been talking about, and what I could talk about for days and weeks. But with all that information being put back into the Oversight Committee's hand, with unfettered access to all of that and all the witnesses we wanted, we could get answers. I know we could get answers. Absolutely could get answers. Or we could just default and let the insurance company do the investigation. And that would turn out to be the cheapest alternative altogether. I think it would be. Absolutely. Um, I know I actually looked today on, the, we had the vote in the during the budget on 
having an independent yes. investigation. That was your amendment. Every Republican voted yes. yes. They wanted an independent investigation. And three Democrats. And three Democrats, right. Costantino, Nunes, and Marcello. Those were the only three. Yes. Um, that's only 15. We need to get... We need more. We need more. We need more. Um, we need more. If, if people in Rhode Island are genuinely upset about 38 studios and genuinely want the answers, it seems like politically we're stymied we are. until we get more people it's very frustrating and who you're say right. they will do the 38 Absolutely. studios because the governor has said yes she wants it and she defaulted on that or she she's not doing it she flip-flopped she well she backed away nobody nobody on the other side really no. wants to get the information absolutely not and i mean the people calling for it the governor and and the speaker are, are saying publicly they want it but yet the attorney general who by the way is term limited and can't run for office again is saying no and i know you did a really good job i know you worked hard i saw how hard you worked hard for, as we could. for two years so i thank you for that well, you're welcome. um and i hope we do get the answers so do i thank you very much for listening the modern world demands that we all have some form of insurance, meaning a bunch of folks all kick in and share the financial risks of life in the fast lane. Now, you want to register your car? Who's your insurance company? You want to buy a house? Who is insuring the house? You arrive at the doctor's office and the first thing they ask you is, who is your insurance company? Routine, right? Well, it wasn't always so. Separate insurance contracts were invented in Genoa in 1347. Insurance got separated from investment when the book, quote, on insurance and merchant bets was published in 1552. Now the first life insurance policies were created by the Amicable Society for a Perpetual Assurance Office, hmm. founded in London in 1706. But unless you can guess how long everyone will live, it is impossible to make insurance work. Now the first life table was written in 1693, but it was useless until the math and statistics needed were in place, and that happened in the 1750s. Life insurance here began in the late 1760s, and between 1787 and 1837, more than two dozen life insurance companies were started. Along the way, the insurance industry has brought lots of sophistication to the process of determining how to stay profitable. Now, this week, a friend pointed me to a website where I could test my life expectancy. So today, I will share with you all the secrets of longevity that I learned from taking the test. Now, I'll take away some of the stress by sharing my findings. From my age today, the test says that I'm good until 87 years. Doubt that, but here's how they got to that number. You start off by telling them how old you are, your height, your weight, and your sex. Now, I fiddled with the weight number, discovering that if I lost 25 pounds, I would add four more years to my life. Hmm. Next, they went into cardiovascular family history. Important numbers here were 70 and 55. If your family member lived until 70 without cardiac issues before they were 55, you win. The number dropped four years if two or more family members had problems before reaching age 55. Next was blood pressure. If you were checked regularly with or without taking medications, you were good. Same numbers. Uh, not under control lost you six years. Hmm. Next up, stress. If you thought that stress is a positive influence, you got one more year. If you said that stress often overwhelms you, you lost one year. Exercise. Daily upped your score four years. If you are not active, you lost six. I walk, so the score for walking a minimum of 30 minutes four days a week was good for five more years than the slug number. How about diet? Now, they want you to eat fruits and veggies. If you do, you get five years over your friends who eat fast or processed and skip the veggies. Seat belts, answering yes, worth four more years. Then, nope, don't use. Driving, some things the insurance companies can get at easily. Accidents and tickets are public records. If you have not had any accidents or tickets in the past three years, you get the best score. If you have more than one DWI conviction in the last five years, you lose 13 years. Drinking. 
The difference between not and lots was seven years. The social drinker lost four years. Smoking, never, and quit more than two years were only one year apart. But the two-pack-a-day current smoker lost 10 years. Doing drugs for recreation lost you eight years. Lastly, how often you got to the doctor. Here I was a bit surprised to find out that regularly scheduled and never visit a doctor was only a one-year difference. So there you have it. All the factors the insurance industry thinks are keeping us alive and well or not. Top four, exercising, driving, recreational drug use, and lastly, the real killer, smoking. More than 400,000 deaths per year are related to the effects of smoking. If you can quit, the risks of lung cancer and heart disease begin to drop immediately. Now, it's been reported that the risk of lung cancer probably returns to that of the non-smoker somewhere between 10 and 15 years after you quit. That is good news. Thank you for watching and God bless.